Welcome to a special edition of Southbank Centre's book podcast. I'm here in the Royal Festival Hall Cafe, surrounded by literature lovers and festival goers. For the past 12 years, Southbank Centre's London Literature Festival has brought together today's leading writers, thinkers and cultural observers to explore the burning issues of our times. In previous years, we've been on a voyage through the entirety of Moby Dick. We've heard Hillary Clinton's strong views on alternative facts, the voice of Margaret Atwood's handbag, and we've heard poetry from Claudia Rankin, Anne Carson and a host of poets from Poetry International. And we've seen the dreams of refugees projected onto the wall of the Royal Festival Hall, to name just a few. This year we'll have everything from a celebration of Homer's Odyssey to an examination of contemporary America in the lead up to the midterm elections. And we'll be bringing you an election special next month, so keep an eye or an ear out for that one. Good evening and welcome to Southbank Centre's London Literature Festival. My name is Debo Amon, Literature Programmer here at Southbank Centre, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Mohsin Hamid and Riz Ahmed, Migration and Magic. We're proud to be presenting this as the closing event of Southbank Centre's London Literature Festival. This year, we have celebrated Homer's Odyssey with Mary Beard and Madeline Miller, examined the roots and effects of empire with Akala and David Olasuga, been made to laugh by Salman Rushdie, by his sharp satirical insights on contemporary America, and sang and danced with Chibundu Anuzu as she told the story of her personal odyssey. As we've heard earlier in the festival, migration has always been a part of human experience. Whether for love, fear, or just sheer necessity, migration is often a physical manifestation of hope. Hope for safety, for prosperity, for a future unseen but held in, in view. A hope, for, a hope more akin to faith, the propelling force behind acts great and small. Writers and storytellers have chronicled this particular act of faith for centuries. From Homer's Odyssey, where Odysseus is forced to leave home yet compelled to return, to Mohsin Hamid's Exit West, where two young lovers es escape the unnamed war-torn city on their own odyssey through, quite fittingly, Mykonos in Greece, London, and San Francisco. For generations, literature has more than just told of stories of migration. It has used the magic of storytelling, and in Mohsin's case, actual magic, to convey the universality of what can be one of life's most difficult experiences. To take us on this journey, we are joined tonight by Mohsin Hamid, author of four novels, Moth Smoke, The Reluctant Fundamentalist, How to Get Filthy Rich in Rise in Asia, and Man Booker Shortlisted Exit West, and a book of essays, Discontent and Its Civilizations. Mohsin's writing is featured on bestseller lists and been adapted for cinema and translated into over 35 languages. We are also joined by Riz Ahmed, award-winning actor, writer, producer, musician, and soon-to-be director. Garnering critical success for his performances in The Night Of, Girls, Four Lions, and Nightcrawler, and appearing in blockbusters including Rogue One, A Star Wars Story, and Jason Bourne, Riz is also the creator of upcoming BBC Two drama, drama series, Englistan, the story of three generations of a British-Pakistani family. His essay in the Nikesh Shukla-edited collection, The Good Immigrant, was also, essential, was also named Essential Reading by The Guardian. Chairing tonight's conversation is writer and journalist Kieran Yates, who currently has a column, in, a column at Vice called British Values and regularly writes for The Guardian, Fader, Dazed, and a host of other publications, and was nominated for Culture Writer of the Year in 2016. Kieran contributed to the critical acclaim book of essays, The Good Immigrant, in 2017, and is also the author of Generation Vexed, What, Eng what the English Riots Didn't Tell Us About the, uh, Your Nation's Youth. Kieran also edits a fanzine called British Values, which looks at culture and immigration in Britain and regularly hosts events and panels discussing issues across music, politics, and the news. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Mohsin Hamid, Riz Ahmed, and Kieran Yates. Hello. Oh, thank you so much for joining us um, in this conversation over the next hour and a half where we'll be talking about migration and magic and I guess what the brown experience really feels like through the lens of literature and art. I am joined by the very excellent Mohsin Hamid, um, who, amongst lots of things, has been introduced very well. But for me, uh, just one of the, my, my favourite works of yours is, of course, The Reluctant Fundamentalist, and we will be chatting a little bit about Exit West, your forthcoming Man Booker Awards nominated novel um so thank you for that and of course Riz Ahmed 
actor, activist, writer. Why are you saying it like that? You know, we do these things. This is the different treatment you get. It's like, it's unbelievable. Repeating what they just said it's, about it's you. Like, oh, uh, only but... because we go way back, innit? Like, <laughs> uh, you know, the brown experience. I just want to see if we won the bet. We had a bet backstage about what the percentages would be. We did. All right. We did a brown ratio. So let's just work this out right now, right? <laughs> just raise your hand if you're dizzy. <laughs> I won by miles. <laughs> Told you. I said 40% because it's cold. I said 75. <laughs> uh, but yes, a round of applause for Riz and my sin. Thank you very much. Um, so we'll talk about your respective works in a minute, but I guess a good place to start is to just ask a simple question. Does home really exist for you guys? <laughs> um, in a geographic sense? In a sort of imaginary homeland sense. Uh, well, I left Lahore when I was three mm -hmm. and went to California and back to Lahore at nine and America at 18, London at 30, back to Lahore at 38. I'm 47, uh, so geographically, I'm pretty confused about you know what 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 home means. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, uh, I suppose I um, have gotten used to the idea of feeling not really at home mm -hmm. uh, in any place, uh, but quite at home in more than one place, mm -hmm. uh, especially Lahore, where I live now. And I, and I, I guess one thing which is strange for me is that um, I live in the same house I spent my childhood in, and my kids are the fourth generation of my family to live there. So when I say that home is kind of a weird concept to me, it, it sounds odd, but it has become like that. Mm -hmm. um, I, think, uh, I think so many people now, uh, so much of our lives is outside of geography that the place where we are, uh, uh, for many of us, only partly feels like home. Mm -hmm. And, you and by, that, by that, do you mean like so much of our lives are lived online or in a kind of like this liminal space between, that, that, does, that is, isn't anywhere? Yeah, all of that. I think, I think that, that, you know, um, the human body doesn't live in a place the way it used to. Mm -hmm. uh, we, like, I live in Lahore. Um, I don't have a closet anywhere in the world that has clothes in it belonging to me that is not in Lahore. But, uh, uh, but you know, to be a person now is to be plugged into all of this stuff from all over the place. Mm. And um, at least for me, that has the effect of, of making it a little bit complicated, the idea of this you know, physical circumscribed city mm -hmm. uh, being my home. And also the, the image of home that you might write about or might think about being very different. I know, Riz, you talked about this idea of the Pakistan that you were shouting out when you were a teenager not being quite like maybe the Pakistan that you then visited. Yeah, I think um, yeah, I'm always interested to hear particularly what Mohsen has to say about this kind of thing because I think I really believe... I've just realised my long johns are showing through my... <laughs> Who's wearing long johns here? <laughs> like, just me, thank you. Yeah, good. <laughs> nice one. Um, I just realized that, you know, because I think home is a place that we build through, through fiction, mm -hmm. through stories. You know, it's a, home is a, is, is a story that you tell yourself, or at least it's a story that other people tell you that you're included in, that you're allowed to be a protagonist in. Mm -hmm. um, a story that you're not a protagonist in sudden, it doesn't feel like a, a, a story you can be at home in. Mm -hmm. um, so when I think about the stories we were told about home growing up, I mean... You know, obviously, you take it for granted that the community and the home that you grew up in, and, and you know, the, a lot of my family kind of live on like two roads, one behind each other, and so that very much felt like home. You know, that that literally that block, and the shops down the road, and that that, that was my home. But um, I think you know, when you start uh, like kind of mid 90s, I remember a very big conversation 
in the same way that these conversations are quite cyclical, we started getting at the turn of the century was when people were asked, are you British or are you Muslim? Where's your loyalty? I remember for us in the 90s, it was like, well, are you British or are you Asian? There were like big think pieces being written about this, you know, as a generation was coming of age, a generation that was born here and was unapologetically kind of... Uh, they're able to articulate their entitlement mm. to Britishness, but also their discomfort with Britishness on the one hand, and their right to modify Britishness on the other hand. And then there was other people's dis, uh, discomfort with their modifications of Britishness. So first it was kind of like uh, my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Then it was like, well, we're British Asian. Mm -hmm. uh, you experience all this racism stuff and you kind of realize, well, maybe it's Pakistan, and you're actually able to idealize Pakistan. So for me in my teenage years, psychologically, um, I would say Pakistan was home, but I had never been there. Did you have a flag and that kind of thing? Yeah, on, oh yeah, on, on Eid, we'd go up and down South or Broadway, waving flags, shouting, <laughs> Pakistan, Zindabad, in, in rented limousines and stuff, and Reebok classics. And, uh, and we were like, Pakistan, yeah, never been, literally never been. <laughs> That's, you know? that's why you were doing it. I yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and again, so home becomes a story that you tell. Yeah. And then, of course, you go to Pakistan and you're like, I do not belong here at all. <laughs> you know, uh, and so, so I came back. And actually, that was, a, that was a big moment for me as a teenager going to Pakistan, realizing that actually what I must have been shouting out, the pride I was trying to express must have been uh, for mongrels like me. It was for a kind of psychological no man's land. Mm. And really a lot of my kind of work since then, since those teenage years, um, has been about trying to turn this no man's land into, uh, into a habitable space. Mm. Because a lot of people do occupy it. It's just not acknowledged in that same way. Um, so yeah, I kind of, the way I articulate it now is, I'm not sure if I really have a passport to anywhere, but I have a visa to kind of everywhere. Mm. I'm able to code switch across cultures and across class. And uh, there's, a, there's a comfort in that. And maybe home is about comfort. Mm -hmm. you know? This you know, idea of... Can I just say one thing on that? Because I think, I mean, uh, as you're speaking, um, I'm a little bit older than both of you, and I've got two small kids. And uh, when I think of home now, mm -hmm. um, uh, most powerfully, I think of the sense of home I'm trying to create and make possible for my children. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I sort of want my kids to grow up feeling that they have a home. And, and it seems to me that they do. Um, I used to feel that way when I was a kid, too. And, you know, perhaps my parents were making that for me at that time, and other people were making that for me. Uh, uh, so, in a way, right now, um, making a feeling of home for my children is the closest I come to like a real, you know, home. Um, and writing one. Yeah, and then, and then writing one, I guess, is making one for me because uh, that's, that's where I get to go my imagination and sort of make a different world. When you're talking about the idea of a kind of uh, imaginative approach to writing about a home, I guess um, historically what we've seen is that people use this trope of magical realism to try and write or unpack the immigrant experience. And why do you think that trope has been so prevalent to unpack it? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, magical realism is, is interesting because, um, I mean, I guess in Britain, it, it very often has a kind of uh, unpacking the immigrant experience connotation. But um, in Latin America, mm -hmm. where it largely grew up, uh, you know, Borges and Marquez weren't unpacking the immigrant experience so much as unpacking human experience. Yeah. Um, and, and for me, in, in Exit West, I didn't think of it as a magical, realistic novel, although I don't reject that description of it. I think, you know, people can uh, think whatever they like. But um, uh, in this novel, there's, it basically obeys the laws of physics as we uh, tend to understand them, with one tiny exception is that people get to walk through these black doors and suddenly be anywhere else, somewhere else mm -hmm. uh, in the world. And for me, that was less of a, I guess, move that I associated with magic and more something I associated with um, what technology is doing to the experience of being alive at this moment where consciousness can proceed through little black rectangles that we all carry along with us mm -hmm. anywhere instantaneously where people are connected in ways that they weren't before um, and where there's been such a focus 
on the story of how one gets from one place to another, uh, which is a very important story, but I think has come to be used as a way of saying, people who've done that are a different kind of person. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe that they're a different kind of person, so I think it's interesting if you take that part away, what do you have left? Like, I haven't crossed the Mediterranean in a small rubber boat, so therefore I'm not like this person who has, because that's the defining experience of their life, except it isn't the defining experience of their life. It was just a horrific thing that had to be done to get from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. That's not who that person is. Um, so I think for me, it, it, it's, it's more of a recognition of the technological moment we live in, um, and also a, a, I guess, political reaction against the journey, a particular kind of journey, being used to separate human beings into two categories, you know, native and, and migrant, which I think are, f are false categories. Mm -hmm. That political moment is particularly interesting and prevalent because there are some moments in the book that are, just feel like such exaggerated, well not even exaggerated, mm. just kind of lends into political rhetoric in Britain at the moment, this idea of Britain for the British um, and these obsolete nativists who have sort of lost the land to this new swathe of immigrants that are coming in and they're trying to protect their country. Um, and it really struck me that actually this conversation makes sense because you, both of you are doing similar kinds of things in terms of adopting different voices to reimagine a current political moment. So how do you feel about that, both of you? Well, I guess in many ways this presents the nightmare scenario, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. The three of us up here and another 600 <laughs> in Queen Elizabeth Hall. Um, but we won. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is actually London Lit Fest, sort of 2118. It will look like this in <laughs> yeah. 100 years' time. Some dystopian mm -hmm. future we're living in. Um, you know, I was just thinking about this, this idea of, um, you know, Br Britain... You know, you just, I just want to go back to a point you were making. I don't know if this answers the question you just asked, but I go couldn't ahead. get this one thing out of my head that you were talking about, mm -hmm. which was this idea of, like, making space. Home is... You're trying to make space mm -hmm. for your kids to feel at home somewhere. And it just occurs to me that... Maybe it's just for us, or maybe it's for everyone. Home is always somewhere else. And that might be a symptom of... I mean, it might be a symptom of, the, you know, having... Coming from a, an inheritance of migration you know, um, also kind of carrying smartphones. But isn't it, in that sense, home something that isn't somewhere we ever really arrive at, but it's something we're always striving for. And it's less a kind of physical place and more of a kind of psychological place, a psychological space where we can be our fullest selves. I'm always um, reminded of this, this quote uh, that I think I, I attribute to Zadie Smith, which is this idea of, um, I think she said something like, all I'm ever trying to do with my work is take words like black or British or woman and stretch them so they're big enough that I can live inside them comfortably, mm -hmm. which I love. And this idea of, when I think of that, that's about making a home. And actually, that does exist outside of geography. That's actually about culture. Mm -hmm. And um, it strikes me that that's kind of what we're engaged in. Mm -hmm. You know, we're trying to kind of find a, a cultural space where we can behave as though we were at home, which means where we can be our unapologetic, contradictory, full, complex selves. Without threatening the status quo. Well, hopefully we do threaten the status quo a little bit. <laughs> you know. um, what do you think about that idea of the threat to status quo? Because the way that it's explored in Exit West certainly makes it feel like this, uh, this kind of fear, this dystopian future is happening in the background constantly, making you feel uncertain. I think there's, there's nothing, you know, more threatened uh, in the world than the status quo, right? Uh, there is no status quo. Mm -hmm. The status quo in this second is over, mm -hmm. in this second. <laughs> and, um, and I think, you know, what, what happens in, um, in a human life is that we, uh, we engage in a kind of migration, every single person, uh, through time, that, that um, moments pass. And as they pass, the world changes around us. And you don't have to leave where you are. You can live your whole life in London. And if you were born here 75 years ago um, and you live in the same house today, the whole city has changed, the world has changed. Mm. Um, so I think, I think migration is the basic nature of what it is to be human. Mm. 
Uh, and I think that related to that is, um, is that the temporariness is the state of existence, right? Everything is temporary. And what's needed is a way to navigate a temporary universe. Mm -hmm. Um, where instead of saying, you know, let's make it like that again or let's keep it like this, we understand that those things are impossible and that the attempt to do them is necessarily monstrous because that's not how time or human life uh, works. Mm -hmm. um, and instead say, okay, uh, everything will be lost um, and everything will be born. And uh, how do we... Uh, find hope and optimism and greater equality and meaning in that reality. Mm -hmm. And that to me is a much more interesting project. And, and I think one thing which, you know, people who appear visibly to be migrants do is they're a constant reminder of that. Mm -hmm. And if you build uh, a society uh, and culture along the idea that, you know, things can be as they were, that's incredibly threatening. Not to the status quo, because the status quo is being destroyed every second. It's, it's threatening to the myth mm -hmm. of permanence that is being you know, peddled to us in lieu of wisdom, right? We're being told that things can stay the same. It's the biggest lie uh, being perpetrated anywhere. It's interesting, isn't it, though, that, that notion of, tr of trying to be comfortable with the fact that everything is lost, because I think a big increasing part of the immigrant experience in Britain certainly is actually about having a cultural stake, having a claim, you know, an artistic claim, a literary claim, saying that we were here, that we contributed, that we want to be written into the annals of history and digitally archived. We want the future generations to know that we were here and we contributed. So how do you think about that idea while also being comfortable with the idea that everything is lost? Well, they will know. I mean, it will be written in, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, when I say that everything is lost, what I mean is that um, uh, I mean, think about race, for example, mm -hmm. right? Like we have this notion at the moment that there are these different races, you know, that there are black people and that there are white people and there are brown people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've made these things up, right? I mean, you know, uh, before America and, you know, and the need to have black people be slaves, the white people who arrived were, you know, English and Irish and Polish and whatever, but uh, you needed a system which allowed you to say these people are slaves, they're black, so therefore these people are now white. And you invent this thing, and, um, and at the moment we seem to believe in the world in these kind of racial categories um, that are incredibly, you know, unstable. Um, and they are likely to, you know, change. I mean, human beings spread out from Africa, the mother continent of us all, and spread in different directions. And as we spread and uh, you know, we began to look more and more perhaps different from each other. Uh, some of us went to colder places, some went to warmer places. Some of us interbred with different kinds of, you know, non-homo sapiens uh, uh, humanoids. Um, uh, Neanderthals in one place and Denisovan man in the other and whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so we wound up looking a little bit different. but. Uh, but the gravity of, of human civilization now is for a coming together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what we know of nature is that, you know, entropy prevails. Uh, you will not be able to maintain these pure categories uh, that you currently uh, believe in uh, in the future. They will mix and mongrelize and become <laughs> something else. And so, and so um, uh, you know, this... this idea, for example, when you say that we were here, mm -hmm. um, it means many different things. But, um, uh, but I think it'll be remembered in its particulars, but it'll also be remembered in you know, part of the remongrelization of a species that you know, briefly imagined 
Uh, yeah, that it belonged to yeah, that it belonged to like that it belonged to these different species which it never which it never mm. did. Okay. Can I just I mean I, I love the kind of picture you paint here, just like I also love the picture you painted of a kind of British military that would retreat from genocide just as tanks were poised mm. in Exit West. Mm. <laughs> and I w and I want to buy into that vision, but I, I just want to kind of challenge this optimism that that the the center of gravity in, in human history right now is is it suggests that we're about to come together. It feels to me there are a great deal of centrifugal forces out there right now. And, um, and yes, biologically, uh, we are already one species. You know, the, the kind of categories of race that we use to kind of delineate, you know, um, different groupings of the same species are very unstable. So that's already a fact, but what we've seen with colonialism, what we've seen with slavery, what we've seen with, you know, these gigantic wars that have threatened to like wipe us out and now, you know, threaten to even, you know, um, even more threatening, is, is, is the power of the story we tell mm -hmm. to, to really uh, cloak the reality from us. If the reality is that we are all mongrels, um, the story that we tell about that reality seems to me at least as powerful, sometimes more powerful than the reality. And we're seeing that from the kind of crazy stories that people are able to tell now in the White House. You know, um, the reality itself may be of oneness, but if the narrative is a very divisive one, I just want to uh, throw in a kind of hint of British cynicism mm. <laughs> about whether the trajectory we're on is, is of a kind of mass coming together. Because I think yeah. the, the story is as powerful as the reality. I mean, I think, I think stories and reality um, blur together, right? So, I mean, I'm Mohsen, you know, you're Riz, but what does that mean, right? We're basically stories that we... People confuse us all the time. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, Super awkward stuff happening yeah. backstage. I actually wanted yeah. to act in Dr. Fundamentalist, and I kept hoping Mira would say, you know, just you're the right man for the job, and then she brought you in, and I thought, well, okay, he's a lot... <laughs> He does look like me, but um, no. I think I think that that uh, you know what happens is that we are, we're born, we start going through this life, and we've got to put it together. A bunch of stuff happens, and so we start to tell a story. I'm Mosin. I'm like this. Here's what happened in my life, and we keep revising that. And we keep revising that. We tell it to other people. It's how we introduce ourselves. We behave in ways that are coherent with that story, and that story starts shaping who we are. And um, actually, the story is not entirely true. You know, we forget stuff, we elide stuff, we, we know that our memory is not perfect, we're not always honest. We behave in ways that don't suit our story, and then we say, oh, well, it wasn't myself, but of course we were, just we didn't like that version of our story. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, people are stories, I think, actually, to, to a very significant extent, and not in some kind of, um, I think that, that, that a human being you know, to make sense is a story. If you don't have a story as a self, you are not a human being in a functional sense that we understand relating with somebody. Um, and I think the same is true of society and culture. Is it is, you know, stories, and the stories are competing. But, um, and of course there are stories right now that say, well, we are not, you know, all one. Uh, we shouldn't be one. That there are innate hierarchies among us, and that some of those hierarchies have to do with the color of our skin or, or um, uh, the place of our birth. Uh, and, uh, and those stories are powerful. Mm -hmm. but, um, but I think that uh, those stories don't lead to a very useful or good place. So at the moment, there's kind of an illusion mm -hmm. that exists uh, in places like Britain and America in particular, which is that it is possible to believe simultaneously in things like democracy and equality, and also to believe in the story that some people are superior to other people, that there's a superior race or a superior national tribe. Um, it isn't actually possible to do that. And now when people come forward and ask, you know, to be treated equally, uh, to have an equal say in a democracy, you know, like a Desi person in Britain or uh, African-American in America, um, society has to make a choice, right? Like, do we really want to be equal in democracy, you know, democratic? Or, you know, is kind of white superiority more important to us? And I think what we're hearing in America right now, 
is, you know, the answer at the moment appears to be from a large number of people, uh, particularly from people who would identify themselves as white. The answer is, you know, between democracy and white supremacy, which, which do we value more? The answer at the moment appears to be, I'm not sure, uh, which is fairly terrifying, uh, but has always been the answer. In fact, maybe until recently, it was actually white superiority was clearly the answer, because mm -hmm. there were slaves, you know, um, and, and there were people who sat at the back of the bus. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think now, those things are really in play, um, this, this contest. And, and partly why, you know, while it's in play, what we're seeing in places like Britain and America is uh, there's those who cling to the idea that we can kind of still have white superiority, supremacy, or kind of a, a nativist, tribalist, British, English uh, identity. Mm -hmm. um, and this place will work just fine. But it won't, because that story, if you try playing it out, it soon collapses, and what begins to emerge is that to maintain the hierarchy, you need to have a totalitarian state that maintains the hierarchy. And so you Or a see, way of creatively responding to the terror, right? Well, well, I'm, well to, yeah, if, to, to maintain the hierarchy, you, need, you basically need militarized borders, you need militarized interior you know, police forces, mm. you need um, uh, supremacist militants, you need all that stuff. Um, and we are seeing the rise of these kinds of things in Britain or America. But I think when people look into the future and say, well, how appealing is this story really? Like, you know, is some Gestapo-like internal police that rounds up people who've come here legally and, 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 and rounds up the people who help those people who come here and their families and, um, you know, is that, is that really that appealing to us? I think the answer is no, and the reason why I say this is, although it could take a long time, is because living in Pakistan, which is a country you know, founded as this homeland for Muslims, we have seen um, that, that it becomes a question of who's Muslim enough, and soon nobody is Muslim enough, because you establish this hierarchy where the most Muslim person is the most Pakistani, the most English person is the most you know, British, the most white person is the most American, and nobody is actually white enough or English enough, or very few are. And, and that system starts to persecute so many of the people inside it that it just becomes pretty unappealing. So I think there will be a battle of stories, mm -hmm. but right now, the weakness of the story that says you can still have whiteness and democracy, you can still have Englishness and democracy, um, has yet to be fully exposed, but it's being exposed. Mm. And when it does, I think it'll be much more flimsy than the story that says, hey, people can all be equal. We can kind of have democracy. It's okay if you, your kids date people who look differently from you. The food will be better. The music will be better. <laughs> you know, um, the dating scene, Riz's parents are in the audience, so I'm not going to say, you know. <laughs> but I just to say the opportunities to hook up will be much more interesting. But this and, is the, the thing about the, yeah. the creative realization of that farce. Yeah. Quite often, and I think for me, most effectively works when you're unpacking it in this humorous way. You know, the sort of the comedy of seeing these things for how they are, I think you both do really well. I think, you know, there's a, there's a point even in, in the book when... Um, you know, Nadia and Saeed are talking and he kind of assumes, because she's wearing a burqa, that she, he, she's very devout. And uh, she says, no, I'm just, I'm just wearing it so men don't fuck with me. And these little kind of moments of comedy and then, of course, when you're, you're writing in, um, you know, typecast as a terrorist and you kind of have this sort of idea that, you know, you would have made it when you can play a character that's just called Dave. I just really love those, those kind of moments of, like, seeing what this kind of social and political context allows you and kind of laughing your way through the other side. So how's important that, has that humor been for you? Um, well, I think it's important to laugh to stop from crying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, just on a very personal level. Yeah. I also think there's something incredibly immediate, visceral and disarming about laughter and making people laugh in that you bypass people's brains, mm -hmm. really. You bypass all the kind of conscious uh, barriers mm -hmm. and kind of logical uh, obstacles that people put up to maintain this delusion, which I think you just touched on, that there is such a thing as an us and them. Mm -hmm. And really, I think the role of all art is to remind us that there is no us and them, there's just an us. Mm -hmm. 
And that really that's what a story is, that's what a beautiful painting is, that's what a great song is, is to, you know, it provides us with the opportunity to, I guess, recognize ourselves in, in unexpected places. Mm -hmm. um, to see ourselves in the other rather than seeing as, seeing other people as, as other. Mm -hmm. um, and I think humor, uh, like just a great tune that you can't help dancing to, you know, is, is very useful, usefully disarming. Yeah. Um, in that you just kind of feel that connection from a very kind of visceral place, a very emotional place. Um, and suddenly that kind of delusion melts away. Like one of my favorite images from uh, Four Lions is the kind of one where it's like in the sort of closing scenes where you're dressed as the honey monster. Sugarpuff Honey Monster, yeah. uh, and you're kind of, you know, you're sort of like <laughs> running down the streets, and you, you know, you have sort of, uh, you know, bombs strapped to you underneath, and what you're projecting is completely different to what you see. And but I mean, you know, there's a lot of stuff that could could be written about that that particular image, but the fact that you sort of are identifying as the Honey Monster in that moment, I just think works really well for that reason. Well, I think what's re really interesting is that we're all identifying as the Honey Monster in that moment <laughs> yeah. and watching it. We're all identifying with these guys who we've been taught yeah. by the dominant narratives in our culture are monsters. Mm -hmm. And really the more disturbing, unsettling truth, which is closer to the truth, I think, which is the truth that all art is trying to bring us closer to, is, um, is that they're just people. Yeah. But people can do monstrous things. Mm -hmm. Um, that they're people just like us. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is, a lot of people find themselves confronted with this bizarre moment in watching that film where you're rooting for a group of suicide bombers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dressed up as, you know, the honey monster. Yeah. Um, you know, I think there's something very powerful in that image in that, you know, the, the honey monster's a character we all grew up with. Yeah. I can't believe we're analyzing the honey monster. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. <laughs> Um, but you, you, you know, these people, uh, just like the people who, you know, these white extremists who are carrying out these shootings at the moment and sending bombs to people, they are products of our society. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you kind of just get that very, you know, immediately and, and visually mm -hmm. um, when you see those ideas are quite literally wrapped up in, in a kind of this... this uh, <laughs> Yeah, breakfast cereal character. <laughs> what are some of those central images for both of you that have really stayed for you? <laughs> like my honey monster. <laughs> in, in what? In, I guess, in pop culture or maybe in literature. I think, um, you know, people reading Exit West for you probably have this very striking image of the door for you. You know, this, this door to these magical worlds that take us through is, is, is quite an overwhelming visual image, isn't it? So what, what have been some of those for you guys? In culture or in literature? I mean... I was saying before, the only books I really read are Mosin's. <laughs> so, um... You say that to all the writers. He's <laughs> 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 flat. Uh, they haven't put me in any of their films yet, though, so... No. <laughs> um, I mean, when I think of some of the images that really kind of stay with me, uh, I actually think a lot about Moth Smoke, Mosin's first book, mm -hmm. and just how cinematic it was in its writing. And you've got this beautiful sequence where, and it's a kind of, it's a technique that you've then really developed and actually located this perspective um, more specifically in modern technology. But it's writing from the perspective of almost like the drone camera, mm. writing from the perspective of the God's eye view of the helicopter kind of wide shot of the city. And is this image of um, a car, um, I think it's Dara's car, driving through the streets of Lahore with its headlights, just lighting up the stretch of road in front of it, just kind of weaving left to right through these really dark streets. Um, and I think it's been really interesting to see how you've then kind of returned to that perspective and you're writing again and again. Um, but I think of the chapter in uh, How to Get Filthy Rich in Rising Asia that's written from the perspective of kind of all the of like drone cameras and all the surveillance, you know, surveillance tech. technology that we now kind of you know willingly keep on ourselves all day. It's funny when you were talking about um, you know the, if people chose white supremacy over democracy, what you'd end up with is militarized borders and constant surveillance. I was thinking, isn't that actually exactly what we've got right now? Mm -hmm. um, but it's interesting that you kind of seem to locate that God's eye view now in modern surveillance technology. 
-hmm. And that's kind of uh, interesting. So I guess I'm asking, is, is God Google in your books? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's a, Google. It's, it's a funny thing because um, I think that, uh, uh, you know, we, we human beings have, have uh, for a long time, maybe forever, used this kind of other to figure out who we are, you know. So uh, Sunni is not a Shia, you know. Uh, a Protestant is not a Catholic, you know, white is not black. Um, and, and so many of our most powerful, you know, human uh, subgroupings are based on some kind of other, mm -hmm. but uh, um, but we are you know very soon going to share our planet with um, an entity entities that uh, are vastly in some senses more intelligent than we are. You know we're in the process of giving birth to technology that can outthink us in so many ways, and I think you know. If, Part of what's happening at this technological moment is that human beings are about to have another, you know, call it AI, call it tech, call it whatever, uh, that, that will require us to think of ourselves as a group in order to find any way to deal with this thing. Because if we go for hyper-militarized AI, you know, we keep arming the thing and make it more and more effective at killing, and we sort of have countries competing at this, you know, that doesn't end well for us. We've, we've all watched the Terminator films. <laughs> we, know that, we know where that goes. But, but also, um, if we blindly continue to merge ourselves into it, uh, by, by uh, attaching it to our attention in addictive, engagement patterns, you know, that, that approximate those of, of, you know, heroin and other drug addictions um, being fashioned for us largely out of the Bay Area in California and then sent out. Um, and we just keep latching into that. You know, that too is going to result in modes of human existence that are pretty horrific, I think. Mm -hmm. So um, I think the good news is that there's going to be this technological other that for the first time, humanity will have something else to look at and say, wait a second, you know, this is not us. Um, and we will maybe be able to conceive of an us mm -hmm. big enough to include all of us, uh, which we haven't really done very much before. And I think global warming is doing something similar, you know, climate change. It, it, its, its scale is that big that it creates, it creates an, um, an us. And so, um, you know, when you talk about imagery and the imagery that I think is effective and the imagery that I really find interesting, uh, in a way, what uh, I'm interested in doing in writing is, is to um, create the context for readers to co-create imagery, you know, with me, mm. right? To, to put stuff out there that the reader then animates in their own mind um, uh, into something that they're seeing. Because what, what a writer shows a reader is letters and punctuation marks and spaces, power breaks. Um, and what the reader is seeing is actual stuff. You know, they have a feeling for what this person looks like and sounds like, and they make them into something real. Mm -hmm. and, and so every writer is, is sort of asking every reader to play make-believe together. You know, my, my son likes to come into my study and end my writing day by roaring, you know, and, and, and poking his head around the door and, and, and looking at me. And, and I'm this sort of, you know, uh, herbivorous, uh, lumbering dinosaur. And he's this lethal, you know, six-year-old T-Rex. <laughs> and he'll sort of stomp in. And <laughs> as he stomps in and he looks at me, he fixes this gaze upon me, and I feel my heart accelerate and I feel the fear, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> my, rep my reptilian brain is beginning to, you know, react. Um, uh, I'm already being pulled into this co-creative imaginary world yeah. that his posture and gaze and complete commitment to the role is, you know, <laughs> is evoking within me. And I think, I think <laughs> that, that, what, that, that writing, storytelling, so much of, about that is is saying, you know, to other people, hey, we can do this together. You know, whether it's watching a particular character um, from our childhood in a new and funny terrorist setting, or it's an image in a novel. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and why I think that's particularly a potent thing 
I think a transformative thing, is you know, when you are reading a book, for example, you're sitting by yourself, you're just you, you know, uh, and yet you're containing within your body, within your mind, the thoughts of two people, you know, yourself and the writer's thoughts as written down in this text. And in that moment, like, who are you? You know, are you you? Are you the writer? Are you some weird hybrid? How is that even possible? How can we be more than one person at the same time? And, and in that space, all the imagery that's being thrown off by your brain mm -hmm. um, is this new boundary blurring craziness. It's so fertile. Um, and, and I think that's where really cool stuff happens. You know, there's a reason why nature has two human beings come together, combine their DNA to make a child, right? It's, it's just crazier and more interesting that way. <laughs> and, and, I think, and I think, you know, storytelling uh, in all of its forms is, is about that, right? It's an invitation to do this thing together and make something. Like the audience is watching this film. The film is just light on a screen. Mm -hmm. You take that for three hours and you capture it in a photograph, it's just a white screen, right? That light becomes whiteness. But, but in that person, something's happening. And, and that for me is interesting, is, is that person is doing something with the image. That's where the interesting stuff is. I just wanted to, uh, well, I've, you've fixed me with that same T-Rex stare in the past and it had exactly the same <laughs> effect on me, honestly. But it's a strange thing I wanted to kind of pick up on in your books, which is about, you know, you're talking about creating the, the negative space for people to project themselves into your work, which all, you know, great art must do, right? You leave space for the viewer, for the reader, for the listener um, to kind of project themselves into the role, uh, into the story. Is that why you never name the cities that your stories are set in? I think you did you name Lahore in Moth Smoke? Yeah, Moth Smoke is named. And then you never did it again. And I'm just wondering what that's about because this is something that as artists and creatives of color, I guess like we engage with at different times, which is to what extent is owning your specificity an asset and to what extent is it a hindrance? Does it box you in? Does it marginalize you? You don't want to be, you know, as a musician, be tucked away at the back of the store in world music. You know? Yeah. You know what I mean? You want to be up at the front of the store. Like, yeah. how much are you othering yourself by <coughs> saying, hey, this is my specific experience? And this is something that I've really kind of, i continuously kind of negotiating and renegotiating this. And it's interesting in this particular moment, which is one where kind of identity politics are very pronounced in, in culture, mm -hmm. not just in Twitter, but, well, I guess on Twitter, and now it's filtered through to everything else. Um, uh, which actually speaks to, I think, the, the resurgence of the us and them narratives to some extent, and you could kind of frame it as a bad thing. We've got this kind of rising tribalism, which is part of our DNA, part of our circuitry, part of our hide wiring as homo sapiens, as, you know, a survival mechanism. Um, but I think it's not necessarily just a bad thing. I think owning your identity, owning the specificity of your experience can throw open some really interesting opportunities for you as a creative in terms of, you know, potentially contributing something to culture in terms of narratives that haven't been articulated before. But also, again, because I think it can sometimes offer people a surprising place to recognize themselves. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm used to recognizing myself in people that look like Brad Pitt. <laughs> but am I used to recognizing myself in people that look like Chadwick Boseman? Mm -hmm. And suddenly there's something, and, and, and there's something uh, about breaking, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the routine of what, which mirrors we used to recognize, like, recognizing ourselves in, which I think can be particularly powerful. And, um, yeah, I've kind of gone back and forth on this. And, 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 you know, I guess overall the trajectory of it for me has been in the beginning when you're starting out, I would really bristle if people ever described me as a Muslim actor or an Asian rapper. Um, because I feared that it would marginalize me and it would pigeonhole me. And, you know, I get that still with people say, you know, a political artist. And, um, and I guess, I mean, that's a different thing because I really believe that all art is political because politics is just a point of view in the world and the stories you tell, you know, who your protag protagonist is, that will always kind of betray a certain uh, set of priorities and a worldview. But, um, but now I kind of feel like it's really important to... to own my self, mm -hmm. to bring my self to the table. Mm -hmm. um, that in doing so, perhaps we can stretch people's idea of uh, 
what pop music can sound like, rather than just thinking, oh, if I bring myself to the table, my music will be thought of as world music, for example. That we can stretch people's idea of what uh, a main stage story can look like. So has it changed the way that you've introduced yourself, or when people ask where you're from, is it... You know, like what I used to say, Indian, and now I say Punjab, and kind of sometimes we'll say Jalandhar. Right. Has that changed for you, or is you still British Asian? Um, I mean, I don't know. Where you're from is a kind of different. I think there's a great cheat for people, a lot of us, pe us in the room, we can say London. And I think London kind of feels more expansive and more global than sometimes Britain, particularly a post-Brexit Britain. Mm -hmm. um, I also think the saying that you're from London doesn't discount your heritage, doesn't, you know, it's our ancestors that built London before we'd ever set foot here. And a lot of people don't realize that. So kind of, I actually think that London is something that feels very expansive for me. Uh, you know, not just in terms of it being a very multicultural city, but in terms of its, its roots and the ancestry of London. Mm -hmm. You know, the story of London can't be told without the story of me and my ancestors, really. Um, the same can be, you know, true of Britain, but it just doesn't sound as cool. And then... <laughs> uh, but I think that there is that constant kind of negotiation that we all, we all have of like, um, yeah, is it an asset or a liability to bring the, 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 our specificity to the table? And, and I really believe that our specificity is what people relate to. When I look at kind of the films of Martin Scorsese or, you know, uh, Woody Allen, it's, it's like these are hyper-specific stories about being Italian, American in Brooklyn, you know, with dodgy connections. It's about being... Uh, wealthy and Jewish from the Upper East Side of Manhattan having relationship neurosis, mm -hmm. you know, and and yet these um, Aren't thought of as marginal stories. They're not thought of as world music, you know, cinematic equivalent of that they um, through their sheer kind of like craft mm -hmm. um, Stretch people's idea of what an American story can be and I often think of the Italian American example because 5% I think of Britain is is uh, British Asian mm -hmm. and 5% of uh, America is Italian American. And when you think of like classic American movies and classic American stories, a lot of time you're pr probably thinking of some of those Italian American ones, you know? And uh, I just wonder where we are in that narrative. I think that there's something about America that makes it particularly porous to like, uh, you know, stories of migration and immigrant stories. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's because of the, the national narrative, America's idea of itself. Uh, and there's still some work to do here, I think, in Britain in terms of the story we tell, how inclusive it is, and, and you know, how we can be a bit more honest about who we are. But yeah, why don't you name your cities? <laughs> um, so it, 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 it's for different reasons in different books, I guess. In, in Mottsmuk, it's Lahore. I mean, the whole, the whole, it's a little bit in New York, but there's 99% Lahore in that book. Um, and and uh, Mottsmuk is built um, as though it's being told to somebody from Lahore. Mm -hmm. uh, now, I think each, each novel, uh, I think Gino Diaz was the person who once said that um, it's like building a cathedral. You have to kn know sort of, you know, where you're looking at it from and how you walk into it, but then once it's built, you can come to it from anywhere. Uh, so Motsumok is written as though it's imaginary you, the reader who comes to be the judge of this weird trial where all these people are telling their stories. Is somebody from Lahore knows all this stuff, and then Doctor Fundamentalist was written um, as though it's being spoken to this you, who's this presumably American character uh, uh, with you know man, buzzed hair, maybe an ex-soldier, mm -hmm. uh, and it's spoken in that way, not because it has to be read by people like that, but because that then gives it a structure, which anybody can come to. I like the idea of using form as a way of, of, of imposing choices into, into, uh, into perspective, um, as a way to partly inoculate myself against subconscious moves on perspective, where I'm kind of actually really trying to write for this person, or really trying to write for that person, or trying to imagine this audience or that audience. Um, it's good to sort of have a, it's gonna be lit this way for this reason, and then that keeps you as a guidepost, it protects you. Um, against various things. In How to Get Filtration in Rising Asia, I wrote that when I moved back to Pakistan, and, um, and I wanted to, I, so I was asking myself, how do I avoid like, self-exoticizing? You know, how do I wind up not writing about Lahore the way that I've read about Lahore? Mm -hmm. um, and I thought, you know, uh, how do I describe stuff for myself? 
And, and then I thought, well, you know, maybe I can't use any names. Um, maybe names are brands that belong to somebody else. You know, maybe Lahore is iPhone and, you know, Islam is, uh, you know, that app and, you know, this name is like Levi's. Mm -hmm. And um, somebody already owns these words. Mm -hmm. If I use them, I can't give them a meaning. Let me describe what this city looks like. Let me describe how this guy acts. Let me describe what happens when this woman prays. And then we have something that means something in that context. So let me find a voice to express it for myself. So it was partly a kind of internal see it for myself rigor. And partly because I thought, you know, um, what if I were to write a book that imagined that Lahore was the universal city? That actually every city in the world, in a sense, has a certain Lahoreness. Mm -hmm. Now, I think that, um, which is not to say that Lahore is the universal city, but that every city has equal claim to be the universal city. See, Woody Allen and Martin Scorsese had it easy because New York already claims to be the universal city. So you can make Manhattan and you can make Gangs of New York, and of course it's about humanity, right? But you make it about Lahore and it's world music, not just because <laughs> you know, people don't buy it so much, mm -hmm. but because it's thought of as being specific to that place. Mm. So instead, you know, what if you say Lahore is the universal city? Not that others aren't, Lagos is, et cetera, et cetera. And, and then try to write this book that is actually very specific to Lahore, yeah. but, but strips away Lahoreness. And then the weird thing that happened with that book is that some of the filmmakers who approached me to want to ad adapt that were, you know, a Mexican filmmaker who said, hey, this is just like Mexico City. And, and this Swedish mm -hmm. um, uh, Egyptian filmmaker was like, I want to set this thing in Casablanca. And, and um, <laughs> because they were seeing these cities in that city. And so, um, and so in that book, in a way, the namelessness was a way to seize um, a position of you know, human universality, not in excess to anybody else's, but equal to everybody's. Mm. Um, I also wonder, just to yeah. decide, um, this, this kind of idea of Lahore not being as mined or written about through the white lens in the same way that India has been historically through, you know, the gaze of Rudyard Kipling and, you know... Very well, Kipling lived in Lahore and, and you know, Kim, Kim right. is set there, uh, partly set there and, and Lahore has been written about Mark Twain came by, wrote actually some pretty crazy stuff in the aftermath of the, of the mutiny. I think the, the lazy tropes. Yeah, the lazy <laughs> tropes the land of milk go, and honey towards, and, go yeah. towards India much more. But, uh, but in a way, um, I, I guess what I was interested in is, um, is not freeing Lahore from, I suppose, the white lens, okay. uh, but freeing myself from an internal white lens which suggested that Lahore is something different. Mm. Um, and instead to say, Lahore is just a place, mm. right? Every place is just a place. If you talk about it, just a place, maybe it's pertinent to other places. Let's see how that plays out. And then in um, Exit West, uh, the only two characters who have names are, say, the Nadia, and, and the city where they initially start isn't named. Um, and the reason for that was partly for the same, you know, I guess, a similar reason. Partly because the city that Nate, say the Nadia start out with, um, for which I use Lahore as an example, uh, I didn't want to write a story that subjected Lahore to the violence that occurs in that book. Oh, because it was mm. emotional for you? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't want to have, write about a mother getting cancer in a fictional story and call her with my mother's name, right? I mean, it's, it seems like inviting incredible violence. Um, it also felt like contributing to these narratives of Pakistani like decline in, and, and that I think, uh, I hope, um, are, are, are uh, unfounded or, or will not prove to be true. Mm -hmm. um, but also because I wanted to let the reader in and to say, look, let this, if you want, be what you imagine it to be. And as I've gone around the book with this, um, I've gone around the world with this book, uh, so many readers have come and, and told me how the city at the beginning is their city or their grandmother's city or their cousin's city or their lover's city. Um, 
and and uh, and so I used Lahore as the starting point. I subjected it to violence, which I'm seeing all around, which is the, the nightmare I have of what could happen to Lahore. Mm -hmm. But um, but but by not naming it, uh, it leaves space. I think I hope for the reader to, you know, name it a bit themselves mm -hmm. and give it a different name uh, than Lahore. So yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, I think the re part of the reason it works is because <clears throat> the writing is hyper-specific. All you're doing is stripping away the labels, mm -hmm. and often the labels and the names themselves, sadly, um, do have an othering effect. And that is some there is something, there's a kind of, um, <clears throat> as amazing it is, as it is, is to kind of recenter Lahore, you know, uh, in the universe. <laughs> There is also an acceptance, which would be crazy not to accept, that there is there are names, even in our own minds, um, <clears throat> are the names of others. Mm -hmm. that our lives are somehow the lives of others. Mm -hmm. You know? That we grow up watching Friends, and we're not in Friends. Or Cheers, and we're not in Cheers. <laughs> you know? Or Red Dwarf. Um, and, <laughs> and, um, and, and there was just something I was thinking about, how, how you leave your names behind when you migrate, you know? How actually in order to really connect, you need to kind of get past the names, you need to get past the labels, which is really what all we're trying to do. But how tricky that is because of course we need the names, we need the labels in order to navigate this mess, increasingly messy reality that we're all in. But I was kind of just thinking as you were speaking about our names. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you've mentioned typecast as a terrorist, but there was an interesting essay as well in, uh, not least to mention your amazing essay in that. Um, but she meant Suleiman. Mm -hmm. uh, called my name is my name. And um, is this idea of like who, are, how do you refer to yourself? Who are you? So everyone in my family, uh, and some of them are here tonight, will uh, call me Golu. <laughs> Golu. Sorry about that. <laughs> Golu, yeah. And Golu means a uh, roundo, spherical object. Because apparently I had a really round head when I was growing up. A big brother came and he was like, he's really round, let's call him Golu. My mom was like, that's so cute. Yeah, let's call him Golu. Thanks a lot. <laughs> so, so they call me Golu. Everyone in my community called me Golu growing up. All my family friends, even like Pakistani rude boys I'd go out with in Northwest London, they all call me Golu. <laughs> that's my name there, right? My actual name is Rizwan. Okay. But that's how I'm saying it now. Rizwan. My parents would probably say, and Urdu would say, Rizwan. Every time I get a cab with an Arabic Uber driver, or any time I meet anyone who's Arabic anywhere, they'll correct me and go, no, your name is Radwan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> this is wrong. It's Radwan. <laughs> I'm like, okay, Radwan. Now, growing up, when I was going to school, I'd introduce myself as Rizwan, you know, you're young, you're in a playground, it's confusing for people, very quickly you become Riz, right? Mm -hmm. And our names have a power. They have a power, they can other us, they can create distance between us and someone else. They can kind of alienate us from our idea of who we are. And for me, Riz was much closer to my idea of who I was. Riz is kind of like sparky and kind of like scrappy, you know? <laughs> Riz is kind of like makeshift and, and, and sharp, you know? <laughs> Riz is, is kind of got an edge to it, but it's short, you know? Um, and Rizwan somehow had Lifetime kind of, Achievement Award. Yeah, yeah. It's a Lifetime Achievement Award, Riz. Yeah. yeah. Um, whereas Rizwan, you know, it has that kind of silk. It's like wearing silken robes. Mm, a lofty name. You know, it's Urdu. Mm -mm. It's kind of has that poetry and that, that, that you know, uh, Mughal ancestry to it, which I had never saw myself in. Mm. As a British Pakistani who grew, grew up not being even called a Pakistani, but a Paki. A Pakistani might call himself Rizwan, but maybe a Paki should call himself Riz. Mm -hmm. And it's some, somehow this abbreviation took place, and I sometimes wonder that in not naming ourselves or in changing our names, how much we're doing that, we're doing that to survive, we're doing that to own ourselves and redefine ourselves with the heritage that, that you know, with what we've inherited, but also we're editing ourselves and censoring ourselves. 
And so I became Riz, and that's who I was. Mm. Um, and, and I just kind of wonder who Rizwan is. And I wonder if I might ever find the confidence to grow into Rizwan mm -hmm. and to own that. And the way I've kind of always squared it is this idea of, well, actually, we live in Britain, and Britain is a nation of Tims, Bobs, Daves, Johns, <laughs> you know, three-letter, one-syllable nicknames. And maybe in calling myself Riz, it's not just that I'm losing Rizwan, but I'm stretching that pantheon of British names mm. to include within it a Raj and a Dev and a Riz, you know? Um, but I think names are interesting. And yeah. do, also how they, but they, uh, they kind of force this sort of insular uh, kind of immigrant or Desi community. So we were having a bit of a chat backstage about, uh, you know, immigrant auntie WhatsApp forwards. So these are for those of you who don't receive them, basically. We were all comparing the WhatsApps that our yeah. parents send us. It's kind of questionable medical advice that you might get from an immigrant auntie. <laughs> via the medium of WhatsApp, and they tell you things like, you know, cut an onion in the room if you have flu and it soaks it up, and various other things. But it was really striking when we were... You looking for your mum? I'm looking for my dad, yeah. <laughs> WhatsApp, right. send, send me those WhatsApp. Where are you, Baba? <laughs> Everyone sends those WhatsApp forwards. They do. But we're having it's not this, a real thing. We're having this, <laughs> <laughs> we're having this discussion uh, backstage and then sort we were wondering of, uh, what people get out of it who well, invents those whatsapp forwards and what is there to, there must be some sincerity they must really think that that's a real that at I mean, midnight really, on sunday whatsapp will start charging they you. really do they must think that it must be real because if it's not real what is it it's very confusing it's very effective but then yeah. the the west african um uh, event manager started to say, well, actually, I get those too. And suddenly it became this sort of conversation between us that, that became not only maybe an Indian experience or a Pakistani one or a, a Desi one, but a kind of technological immigrant experience that we could all understand. And, you know, this idea of the story, you know, the storytelling of, you know, your auntie telling you not to drink cold water suddenly became really, you know, it, it was this kind of real unifying moment. So... Um, yeah, maybe just tell us about a couple of your WhatsApp forwards or, just, well, or the significance of, of those unifying stories or moments. Um, I mean, I, I think, as I was saying in the back, I think that there's a little department in the mobile phone companies in places like Pakistan and Nigeria which come up with these things. And, uh, say, and India. <laughs> India, and say, so, you know, put it out there. Let's get a few million uh, messages. But... Um, you know, as far as unifying stories are concerned, uh, and, I, and I think, and I agree, I think taking away names is also very interesting. So, uh, uh, ignorant fundamentalist, the you, the American, doesn't get to speak, it doesn't have a name. Uh, but Chinggis does. And in Exit West, say the Nadia have names, but nobody else in the book has a name. Just these two people have names in the entire book. Um, not because nobody else matters, but because names do matter. But I think it's, it's interesting to not just take and say names exist, so therefore we use them. Mm. It's, okay, we're going to be very, very specific. Every place is named except the place they come from. But no human being is named except for these two. What does that do? I think it does stuff. And, and so, um, you know, when you talk about universal things, I think that, you know, what's, what's interesting to me is um, we work in these forms you know, uh, song, fiction, film, essay. Uh, how do we push that form along? Like, how do we bang that form into a new shape? Like, how do we do stuff with this that maybe hasn't been done before? Uh, and maybe that is something which is very specific to ourselves. Mm -hmm. that, that, you know, that I'm not just trying to tell my story, or I'm, I'm maybe I, I am, but I'm trying to say, how can stories be told in a way which they haven't been told before because a new form of storytelling is required for me to do what I need to do. And then when you think about how do you approach that, what do you bring to it, um, there can be all kinds of interesting stuff. So, I mean, for me, for example, uh, in, uh, in my last two novels, this idea of, you know, in a world of, of transience where nothing is permanent, you lose everything, what do we have to hold on to, right? And, and one of the things, uh, uh, there's so many things in 
ancient culture wisdom that, that comes to us from many different cultures. And one of the ones that I'm familiar with is this idea, a kind of Sufi idea of love. And, um, and then I was thinking, okay, well, what does that Sufi concept of love mean in this context, right, of hyper-capitalism, of, of complete movement, uh, of, of uh, mass nativist resentment against migrants? Mm. Um, how can that be deployed? What can I learn from it? And so, you know, is there a way of telling a love story that, that tries to bring a kind of Sufi sensibility into what that love would be? And then the question becomes, well, what is a Sufi sensibility of what love would be? You know, what does that mean? Uh, and, and then I started thinking, well, okay, so what's the whole point of this love thing that we hear about in Sufism? Like, what is it? Um, and then I was thinking, you know, living in Pakistan and seeing uh, my parents play with their uh, grandchildren every day. Uh, uh, you know, I live in Lahore for many reasons, but probably the most important reason is because I live next door to my parents. Mm. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so my parents get to play with their grandkids. And, you know, my uh, father lost his uh, brother recently. He lost his best friend recently. And yet he talks about, you know, um, finding a place for the kids to ride their bicycle and, you know, building this kind of uh, balance beam for them to like walk on and see how that's gonna go and gets very excited about this stuff. <laughs> and it's interesting because you think, oh, why is he talking about the future in an excited way? You know, what's exciting him about the future? Oh, his grandkids' future is exciting him. Why does he feel excited about a future that should be frightening? Right? Because there's a particular love that's occurring here. What's the nature of that love? It's not a possessive love. He doesn't own these kids. He knows, as every grandparent does, that you know, they won't be there for the totality of that child's life. Right? They don't get to own them the way that we might imagine that we own a spouse or a, you know, a lover. Mm. Um, you know, this is a kind of non-possessive love that is strong enough that one's own sense of mortality begins to become a little less horrifying, right? And then, okay, how do you write a love story about people who are able to let go? What does that look like? And, uh, and Exit West, you know, in that sense, was written with that sentiment. So it's, in a way, hyper-specific to a particular kind of cultural context, mm -hmm. but... Um, uh, but tries to take that um, and, and present it as part of the repository of human wisdom that we all participate in, whether you're of a Muslim background or not a Muslim background. Uh, because I think we've now come to a point in human culture where we have to find a way to talk about these things that used to be spoken about in religious terms um, by people who are initiates to that religion. Mm. We have to find a way to speak of these things temporariness, you know, the sense of mortality, what life means, um, loss, uh, in a way that every human being can participate in. Mm -hmm. And so you bring into it the specificity of your experience, of what you're aware of, your background, but at the same time you try to open it up so that anybody can come to it. Uh, and for me, that's, that's uh, in a way where I guess I, I come out on, on, the, on a lot of this stuff, is that I try to bring into my work um, a lot of things that I think is specific to myself, the places where I am, the culture I come from, uh, but to put it into the world in a way which says to every other human being that this is your, yours too, mm -hmm. right? Because you are the reader of this. You will take this and we will jointly make something together. And, and that for me is, is actually really interesting and that results in new kind of formal approaches to storytelling and, and a way to thereby stretch, you know, what a story is so that we can be the, Scorsese, the Scorseses and the Woody Allens because now there's a form of this novel or a form of this story which is big enough, uh, you know, for us and can be universal uh, in a way that it didn't feel like, uh, for me at least, existed. We have to, I think, invent it for ourselves.